Uh, the third paper is about corporate loan spreads and Alessandro will be presenting. Okay, do you see my slides? Perfect. Okay. So thank you for the organizers for having me here today. I am presenting corporate loan spreads and economic activity. And this is joint work with Anthony Sanders, uh, Sasha Stefan, and Daniel Streitz. Now, there's a long tradition of uh, using credit spreads to forecast the business cycle. And this is typically motivated by some theory of financial market frictions. Now, on the empirical side, uh, we tend to use corporate bond data because it tends to be uh, more available. Uh, but a large part of the uh, real economy is dependent upon bank debt. Um, and I think this is nicely captured by this quote from Lopez, Lido, Stein, and Zakrasek, who say, we have in mind that the pricing of credit risk in the bond market is linked to the pricing of credit risk in the banking system. Although the former is easier for us to measure empirically, we suspect that the latter may be as or more important in terms of economic impact. Now, this segues nicely to our paper, because what we're going to do is we're going to use a novel data set to explore the ability of corporate loan spreads uh, to forecast um, economic developments. So just to motivate a bit more why we should focus on the, uh, on the loan spread, here I show three things. So the black line is the corporate bond spread of Gilchrist and Zakrasek. The red line is our loan spread, and I will explain in a moment how we, um, how we get to this. And the blue bars are the year-on-year -year growth rate in industrial production in the U.S., so here we can see that starting in late 2018, in the face of tightening policy and a trade war, that the U.S. economy has started to weaken. But the bond spread hardly reacts, um, if at all, uh, whereas the loan spread clearly starts to react to the weakening of the economy. And it's this differential reaction um, that we want to understand a bit more in this paper. So what do we do? Well, first, we develop a new credit spread based on the secondary loan market prices. Now, is this a useful exercise? So we argue yes, for at least three reasons. So one, the loan market covers a universe, uh, a wider universe of borrower than the bond market, which may be a better proxy for the, the true state of the economy. Second, um, we can uh, compare countries um, in which uh, bond uh, you know, bank debt is, is, is a, more, a more important source of finance. And thirdly, as we've seen central banks become more and more active in corporate bond markets globally, um, going forward, the bond spread might not be the signal that it used to be because of this intervention. So what's the main result? Well, the main result is that a one standard deviation um, increase in loan spreads predicts a 0.41 standard deviation decrease in industrial production over the next three months. Now, this is twice the magnitude of the bond spread. And more importantly, if we include both spreads in the model together, um, the, this effect remains uh, unchanged. Now, this is robust to using a range of macro variables as a dependent variable, looking at different time horizons, using other benchmark measures of credit spreads that are commonly used in the literature across countries, uh, across industries within the US, and out of sample. Then the second part of the paper then tries to answer, well, why does the loan spread have this additional predictive power? And we show there's a joint role for both the borrower balance sheet frictions and the intermediary, intermediary balance sheet frictions are both playing a role in explaining this differential predictive power. Specifically, we find two thirds of the uh, pr predictive power is really coming from the deterioration in the borrower balance sheet health, okay? And then finally, in the last part of the paper, we start to address this issue of how do we aggregate our data? So we have loan level data or bond level data, and the typical approach in this literature has been to just take a arithmetic mean of all spreads available each month. Um, but we, 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 we start to look at different ways of doing this. So we look at industry level spreads to see if they have additional information for forecasting. And we also look at different ways to aggregate um, these, these data, but I'll come to that hopefully at the end of my presentation. So let's dive into the data. So the syndicated loan market has been around for a while, um, but it wasn't until the late 1990s that an active secondary market evolved with the formation of the Loan Syndication and Trading Association. So from the LSDA, we have uh, 20 years of uh, 
daily uh, price quotes for the uh, universe of loans. So for our main sample, we're going to focus on US non-financial firms. We'll focus on term loans because those tend to be the ones traded in the secondary market. And this will give us about 300,000 loan month observations. We'll merge this with deal scan to get our loan level contract details, which we'll need to calculate the spread. Um, for, for the for bond spread, we use the publicly available Gilchrist and Zacrosec spread, but we have replicated it for a, for a few tests in, a, in, in the paper. And we use the standard macro data sources. Now, how do we construct the spread? Well, we're going to do the same bottom-up spread approach as Gilchrist and Zacharysek. So for each loan, we can, each day, we construct the sequence of future cash flows using the uh, LIBOR forward curve. So with the price from the LSTA and this sequence of cash flows, we can then back out the implied yield to maturity for the risky loan. We then construct a synthetic risk-free loan with exactly the same cash flow profile as the loan, but discounted at the risk-free rate. Hence, the loan spread is just the yield to maturity on the risky loan minus the yield to maturity on the synthetic duration-matched risk-free loan. And then the aggregate loan spread is simply an average of all the spreads we have available uh, each month. And here's what we get. So the black line is the bond spread of Gilchrist and Zacharysek over time. And the red line is our loan spread over time. And you'll notice a few things here. So in terms of levels, they are highly correlated, but not perfectly correlated. Uh, outside of the crisis, um, that correlation drops. And in fact, if I were to plot this in terms of first differences, as in the change in the spread, that correlation drops even, even further. And in fact, for most of the paper, our object of interest is going to be the changes in spreads, okay? We also see that the loan spread is more volatile um, than, than the bond spread. And we also see that the loan spread is higher, structurally higher than the bond spread, which is the first sign that we have that the loan market must be made up of a different type of borrower because we know that loans rank higher than bonds in the capital stack, um, so, yeah, so this is the first time that we have that there. There's different types of borrowers in these uh, two markets. So how are we going to test uh, these spreads? Well, we'll use a standard forecasting um, uh, regression setup. So we'll have on the left-hand side the H period ahead growth rate in our macro variable. For the slides, I'll focus on industrial production. But in the paper, we have done farm payroll and the unemployment rate. Uh, as controls, we'll have the term spread will have the real effective fed, uh, fed fund rate. And then the Delta S will be the change in our credit spread, either the bond, the loan, or sometimes both. And here's the main result that I uh, uh, introduced. So a one standard, standard deviation increase in the loan spread is associated with a 0.41 standard deviation decrease in industrial production over the subsequent three months. If we use the bond spread, uh, we see that the effect is about half um, the size. But more importantly, when we horse race the two spreads together in the same model, we see that the bond spread is no longer significant, but the, the, the loan spread retains its um, significance. Uh, just a quick note, so if we look at the incremental R squared, that is the increase in R squared by adding in a credit spread, we see that the loan spread buys us about 15 percentage points of in-sample R squared, whereas the bond spread only gives us about three and a half percentage points. So that was at the three month ahead horizon. What about at other forecast horizons? Well, in this Jordan uh, uh, style local projections, we can see that the loan spread to predictive power extends to the two, three, four month ahead um, horizon, whereas the bond spreads um, forecasting power seems to peak um, uh, much, uh, much later. Now, there are a number of extensions and robustness checks we do in the paper, but I'll just highlight a few of the more important ones um, here. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, the loan and bond market are not comparable in terms of types of borrowers. So maybe a fairer comparison is to, comp is to compare the riskier bonds. And so in the first two rows here, we look at the riskier uh, portion of the bond market. And we find it does have pr predictive power, but it still cannot um, match what the loan spread um, can do. And when I include the loan spread, these uh, high yield spreads become insignificant. Um, we then look at equity returns. Equities being the more informationally sensitive instrument um, should have predictive power, and they do, but again, still cannot match what the loan spread um, can do. 
Uh, in the next row, we adjust for contract terms. We know bonds and loans tend to differ on a range of dimensions. So once we control for these, um, the baseline result doesn't change that much. And then finally, we take out the financial crisis, which dominates our, our, our sample period. And we still find the loan spread does have predictive power, whereas the bond spread, even on its own, no longer has any predictive power outside of this crisis period. So let me just get through that. So uh, this raises the natural question, well, why does this loan spread have this additional predictive power above and beyond um, the bond spread? And one possible story is that loan market borrowers may, be, may have limited funding alternatives and hence are very sensitive to the shocks to the balance sheets of intermediaries. Hence, any reduced capacity or, or willingness of these, uh, of, of these banks to lend um, uh, may, be may be what's being reflected in the, in the, in the loan spread. So to test this, we look at the Fed's Senior Loan Officer Survey of Financial Conditions. And in column one, we see that uh, an increase in the loan spread in a given quarter is positively associated with a tightening of financial conditions in that same uh, quarter. And in columns two and three, we see a, a weaker correlation between uh, the bond spread and financial conditions. And then in columns four, five, and six, we at look at the undrawn credit lines from the US call reports. And we see that an increase in loan spreads is associated with a, a decrease in the amount of um, undrawn credit lines available uh, for firms. So if you take this together, it kind of suggests that um, uh, the, the, the increase in, in loan spreads is associated with a reduction in the supply of credit um, in, in the economy. So another way to see this is we uh, we do the same credit spread decomposition as Gilchrist and Zakrasek. So we take our loan spread and we break it into two parts. The first part is driven by borrower default risk. We call this the predicted loan spread. And then there's a residual component, um, which we call the excess loan um, premium, which captures everything else, including any intermediary, intermediary balance sheet frictions. So in column one, we can see that the ELP is significant. It does have uh, predictive power, um, which is consistent with this first um, explanation. But you'll also see that actually the predicted spread um, has, a, uh, has a larger effect. And in fact, if we look at the um, contribution to incremental R squared, um, I mean, two thirds of it is coming from the predicted spread, okay, which, which uh, uh, will lead me to the uh, second story. And that is, Potentially, loan market borrowers may be particularly sensitive uh, to financial frictions that emanate from their own balance sheets. Okay, and this is captured by the idea of this external finance premium of uh, Bernanke and, and, and Gertler. So, to to understand this a bit better, we first look at the characteristics of our borrowers. So, in the top row, I am plotting the age distribution of loan market borrowers and bond market borrowers, and we see that loan market firms tend to be um, uh, much younger than bond market borrowers. And in the bottom row, you can see that loan market borrowers tend to be much smaller firms um, as well. Now, I should note that for this, uh, for this figure, I'm only using public loan market borrowers. So these firms that I, I can link to CompuStat and create these, these variables for. So if anything, uh, and half our sample is actually private firms, so firms I can't link. So if anything, this figure probably understates the true difference in characteristics between um, these two markets. But with this in mind, we then go back and we construct a loan spread conditional on being a small and young firm. And we see that the um, main result is quite similar to our baseline result that I first showed you. Um, we then construct a loan spread conditional on being a large and old firm. So these are the firms which most overlap with the bond market. And we see that the result is actually quite in line with the baseline bond spread result. Okay, and then finally, in column three, I include everyone else, all the private firms which I cannot link, uh, I cannot have size or age data for. And so, what we see is that it's not all the loans in our sample which have this additional predictive power. It's really being driven by this subset of smaller, younger private firms, for, for which we know there is good empirical and theoretical evidence um, that these are the types of firms which frictions uh, matter most, and they are most sensitive to the um, conditions in the economy. And hence, that's what our, our loan spread is picking up. 
Um, another way of looking at this is looking at borrower ratings. So we can look at borrower rating distributions. And, um, and once again, if I sort loans by rating classes, we find that it is the loans of uh, the riskiest borrowers which have the most um, predictive uh, power. Hence, uh, maybe a repricing of risk by banks may be better reflected um, uh, in loan spreads uh, rather than bond spreads. So in summary, what, what I've shown you here is that there seems to be evidence for both uh, uh, borrower balance sheet frictions and intermediary balance sheet frictions, okay, in, ex in explaining this uh, pr predictive power of the loan spread. Um, whereas, uh, and about two thirds of this power is coming from the uh, deterioration of borrower balance sheet frictions in, in particular. So in, in the final part of the paper, we now, we, we, we then explore uh, different um, aggregation methods. Two minutes. So, Two minutes, perfect. Um, so we, we, we look at the uh, industry level loan spread. So, uh, and, and we find that there is additional predictive power um, if we look at industry level spreads for predicting um, industry macro variables above and beyond um, the aggregate spread. Um, and we, we then look at which industries are most dependent upon external finance. And we find it, it is those industries most dependent on external finance who have the most predictive power, which is consistent with our previous two um, stories. And finally, we look at different aggregation methods. So we, we can aggregate those, loan spread, those, those industry loan spread different ways to create an aggregate spread. And basically what this table shows us is that um, if we look at different ways of weighting the data, we can actually improve the forecasting um, uh, power of our baseline model e even further. Um, but, but there's definitely a more um, work we need to do here in terms of different types of uh, methods. So let me conclude here. So in this paper, we, we introduce a novel measure of credit spreads using secondary loan market prices. And we find that these loan spreads have additional information above and beyond other credit spread uh, measures. And we, we, we think this additional uh, pr predictive power is coming from these compositional differences between the two markets. Now, is this useful? Yes. So as I, as I said at the beginning, um, we see that the, the loan market is made up of a, a wider universe of borrowers and it is those, exactly those borrowers which have the most predictive power. And, and as we've seen um, in, in COVID recently, as central banks become more active in the corporate bond market, um, the bond spread might not be the, uh, the, the signal it is going forward. Hence, there might be a role for the loan spread uh, going forward in, in future crises. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Alessandro. So we'll open the floor for questions from anyone. I can start with a question. Uh, so, I mean, I find it fascinating that when you look at the spreads right before the COVID crisis, they were already going up. Uh, and there's always this question, maybe there was a recession coming with that COVID. Uh, now, if you look at a few years before, you had also an increase in the spreads around 2016. Um, and those sort of correlate with a decline or at least a slowdown in growth in industrial production. So again, your spreads are working well. And all your regressions show this correlation between spreads and industrial production growth. Now, sometimes we don't want just to predict activity. We want to predict these events that we call recessions. Uh, now, you don't have, of course, a lot of data because there's not that many recessions out there. But is, is there anything you could say about the ability of these spreads to anticipate just recessions, not just the decline in economic activity in a couple of quarters or in a couple of years? Yeah, I mean, that, that is definitely a, a, a good question and, and, and something that has come up before. But I guess as, as you point out, I mean, we have two recessions in our sample period. That's, so this is a, a major restriction we have with, with this data. I mean, uh, something uh, that we, we, we could look at is the, the industry level data. So we have data across 11 uh, different industries within the US. So the, the panel data buys us a bit more um, uh, a bit more space to explore. Um, for, so, so perhaps we can't look at, um, uh, you know, aggregate regression, uh, recessions, but perhaps across industries, we might be able to better predict industry cycles. Um, and, uh, and, and, and something I didn't really uh, mention in, in the presentation is that we also look at uh, Spain, France, and Germany. 
Um, so we have some some cross country data as well. Um, so potentially we, we we could extend our analysis across multiple countries. Um, but again, yes, uh, sample size is always going to be our, our biggest constraint, and there's unfortunately not much we can do about about that. But it, it is definitely an, an interesting question that we should probably um yeah think about more about the recession, uh, given how important it is in the literature. Okay. But yes, thanks, Antonio. Okay. More questions. Yes, Bernie. Yeah, I I would like to hear your your thoughts about why the long spreads have so much more predictive have so much better predictive power than the bond spread. What 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 explains the discrete the differences? So I mean, the short story, if I would were to say it in one sentence, I would say it comes down to the composition of borrowers. Okay, I would say that the loan market is made up of a type of firm which tend to be smaller, younger, and more sensitive to the health or the state of the economy. So I think th what the loan spread is picking up is the, the deterioration in the health of these borrowers right at the turning point of the economy. Okay, so it's these uh, you know, smaller, um, younger borrowers who are more sensitive to financial uh, to funding conditions and to the health of the economy, and it's those these firms which are picking that up, and hence why I think this is why it has that additional pretty. But whereas the bond spread is made up of you know bigger, larger firms who are probably less financially constrained, so they will pick up you know the deterioration only later when it starts to affect them. But the the loan spread really is picking up these um smaller, um younger private firms. That's my that that's our interpretation. As I as I listen to your your really wonderful presentation, I learn a lot. I keep on asking the same this question, and one answer would be about the type of firms you are. But what if I I ask the the question? What if I think of the the bonds are really related to uh, the larger companies, and they all are in a certain class? So it's a matter of really the aggregate. I mean, of course, there's a difference between like I'm triple A, B, and then down to nowhere. Um, but now I'm just, instead of talking about the different classes, I'm thinking about a different level of aggregate. If mm -hmm. I pull all, if I, 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 I do not get, I pull a hundred and give you only one data point, whereas I have a hundred data point, then just based on that, you may have better predictive power if you have more data points. I I I I I'm cutting I'm cutting here here, uh, but I am yeah. really trying to understand. You know, I I think the economics behind this difference in predictive power is very important. I mean, uh, yes, um, certainly we, we we could definitely um, explore um, as as I as I as I hinted at at the end, we could definitely explore different ways of uh, of aggregating the data. So we, we, in the paper, we do um, look at the loan spread cut by, yeah, as I said, size and, and, and rating class. Um, um, but uh, there are probably different ways we could, we could aggregate this data. I mean, our baseline results focus on this uh, baseline loan spread, um, which kind of treats every loan, um, uh, every loan equally. But um, given that some loans have this additional uh, predictive power, it probably makes sense to to weight loans differently. Um, so yes, I think there's definitely room for us to explore how we um, weight and construct um, our, our loan spreads to further improve the predictive power. And it's something we start to do towards the end of the paper, but I think there is definitely room and scope for us to explore this issue um, a bit further. I don't want to monopolize the airtime, but uh, let me push this a little bit. And uh, um, central banks they do a lot of they do a lot of work to to try to predict the future economic activities. Mm -hmm. Do they incorporate your information? Um, so, from what I've looked at, so there are a number of financial conditions index posted by various um, Fed. Um, um, uh, Fed banks, Kansas City Fed, and, and so forth. So I, so the, the ones I have looked at don't include the loan spread index. They tend to include the term spread. They tend to include um, some some bond um, spread indexes. But from what I've seen from the publicly available indexes, um, they don't include the loan spread index. So yeah. then I would hazard. 
then do they include surveys on business activities of SMEs and so on? Yeah, I mean, they, they, the Fed definitely has a number of surveys where they track um, mm -hmm. financial lending conditions, mm -hmm. like, such as the senior loan officer. Survey. So definitely they uh, have a sense of this, but I guess the mm -hmm. loan spread is, a, is, is one kind of measure which kind of, I guess, incorporates all this information to like, uh, into one. So it would, be, it would be really quite interesting to, to run a sort of like a crazy horse race to, to see what they have. The important mm -hmm. thing is really about what, I mean, do our decision makers uh, get the... Uh, as precise, as accurate uh, prediction as possible. And yeah. that is really the important question. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess it's a tough thing to know what is the information set of, of the of the policymaker and can we improve upon that information set? I mean, maybe behind the scenes they do have this data and they're just not telling us they look at it. I, I mean, but definitely I think that's definitely an, an, an interesting thought and something that we should probably um, think about more, definitely. Um, I mean, we definitely should also look at how we, um, what does our paper mean for policies? Um, I think that's definitely a question um, that we could do a better job of explaining more in the paper of how does these results actually matter for the um, policymaker? What, what does our results help them do? So I think that's definitely uh, something very useful, something we should do more. So thank you, Bernard. Okay, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, we're right on time, so I think we're going to have to close our session. Now, this is the last regular session of the International Macroeconomics Money and Banking Program for this year. There's a separate session tomorrow, which is co-organized with CIBR as well. Now, Takeo and I, as program directors for, for these sessions, uh, we'd like to thank everyone, of course, presenters, discussants, panelists, the audience, for, engage, for three engaging sessions, which unfortunately they had to be virtual this year. Now, a special thanks to the two conference organizers, Ipe and Helen, that put together a great program uh, of papers and selected amazing discussions. Uh, and of course, we look forward to the 2021-22 annual conference, where hopefully we'll be all in Singapore getting uh, together through coffee breaks, not just through this virtual system. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Well well, ABF, yeah, I want to thank the program directors and the conference organizers and the presenters and the discussions and all the participants. It has been really a great experience. We thank you for your participation in spite of the challenging time. And what you've done is very endearing to us all. Thank you very much. And I look forward to welcoming, welcoming you all in Singapore in person with a good glass of wine and a good meal. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Bye.